Good morning, guys. Um, let's start with a word of prayer. There's only one thing that I seek of you, Jesus, this morning. I pray that I will preach you. That's all I want to do. My humble request is that I, I want to preach Christ. So help me, grant me the grace to preach Christ. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> um, you're welcome to Rema City one more time. Let's start. <coughs> Sorry. Let's start with our drills for this morning. Um, say with me that I don't know what's wrong with my voice this morning. <coughs> Sorry. Um, I'm the Rema of God. Say with me that I'm the Rema of God. <coughs> the devil is a liar. <coughs> I am the Rema of God. Say with me that I am the Rema of God. I will never lack Rema in my ministry, in my career, in my academics. In every area of my life, physically and spiritually. Amen. So today um, is the final of our series, I'm a type of Christ. I'm a type of Christ. And today we will talk about um, the, um, Moses. Um, since today is, is the last uh, one, it might take some time. So I will take my time. I will not rush through um, this one. All along, we've, we've learned that we are all types of Christ. And like I always say, the, the reason behind it is, is, is very simple. Adam was the first um, um, being that God created. And Adam was a type of Christ. And today we are all types of Christ because we are born of the incorruptible seed of Jesus Christ. Um, there are so many similarities like I've done in the past between Moses and Jesus. I will go right ahead and share that right below on my Facebook link. And then we will continue on right ahead. Okay, so I just um, shared it. Um, let's go. So today we will talk about Moses. Moses, 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 Moses. The first one, Moses was a savior and so was Jesus. Jesus is not a savior. He's the savior. There is no other savior. I repeat, he's the savior. He's the only way, the truth, and the life. Um, the, the first one, um, the one that I've shared, it has so many similarities between Moses and Jesus. But I would like to um, briefly talk about probably about six of them, and then we'll go ahead. Um, um, they both worked on water, you know, like literally speaking. Uh, Moses, before you can cross, you know, cross over a sea, you have to go through it. And so when I say they literally worked, they both worked on water, that makes sense, right? So Moses led the people of Israel, and then what? They walked on dry um, land or ground through the Red Sea. Now, the, that whole walking on water or the work that they walk through, whether on dry ground or whatever it is, it's a type of salvation on its own. It was a type of salvation, and I will explain. So all those who were not able to make it, as in the Egyptians, the Egyptians is what Egypt um, in the Bible is a type of, I would say, the world. It, it represents sin, you know, like mainly speaking, it, it represents sin. And the Bible says that there is no sin in heaven, and sin is not permitted to enter into what into heaven. And so sin cannot, it's, it's, it's impossible for sin, you know, to, to, to go into heaven. And so Egypt or Egyptians who are like a type of sin, these guys were not able to make it or to be able to cross over to the other land. And so all those who made it were God's chosen people. In other words, all those who made it were God's elect. Got it? And so... When you turn it around and then you come to Jesus as well, Jesus walk on water. And there is something, um, this is a very popular story that we all know, what ensued between um, Jesus and Peter on the water. Um, so when Peter saw Jesus, he said that if this is you, then command me to come. And at the word of Jesus Christ, Peter what, began to walk on water. And so as long as he remained focused on Jesus Christ, he was, what, he was able to, what, to walk on what on water as long as moses lifted that broad you know and they were all focused on their journey they were able to what to make it to their promised land it's the same thing with what jesus did now when he said come when he said what come jesus said come i want us to take notice of that it's, it's very important because his word said that what i called you you didn't choose yourself i what i i called you i called you and so jesus gave him that word you know that command that come before peter even made that first step to walk on what to walk on water 
So it is important for us to, 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 to take note of that. You can find that in Matthew 14, verse um, 28. And um, when you read John 3, verse 36 to the Bible says that he who believes in the Son has eternal or everlasting life. And he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. And so that means that so long as you are focusing, you are looking on to Jesus, you are okay. But when you look outside, you know, then, then, then it means you will not be able to, what, to, to, to make it. And so Jesus here, we see that he's full of what? He's full of grace. The Bible said that he's full of grace and truth. In the Greek, that is um, grace, which is what? Which is truth. And ask yourself, why Peter? Why not John? Why not James? Why not any other disciple? You know, I, I, I need you to also kind of think or ponder over that. Why Peter? Why Peter? Because the Bible says that what? Um, in, in Matthew 16, verse 18, that now I say to you that you, Peter, that you are what the rock upon which I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not what will not conquer it. And so there was a reason why God programmed Peter that way and to have that sort of temperament, you know, that that I can do spirit, that I would do it spirit, even when everybody else is falling back. You know, this guy would say, I would, I would do it. And so Peter here is what is a type of the of, of, of the church of us. And he took that bold step. You know, and he was what he was able to work to work on water. And so, whatever temperament you know you you have, I would say God knows why He created you that way, and He can use that for His glory in His kingdom. You know, um, late Dr. Mao said something that when the purpose of a thing is not known, abuse is inevitable. But it doesn't mean that you should blend in. No, keep on keeping on. That's all I can say. Keep on keeping on. At the right time, God Himself will what will lift you up and will use whatever temperament that you have to glorify his own name. Um, Moses controlled the water. And so Jesus, we, we, we know in the, um, the Gospels that Jesus calmed the waters. As a matter of fact, the water seemed to be a playground for him because at his word, you know, fishes and all. Um, um, Peter said that we've told all night. But at, when, when he spoke, he was able to do you know, these guys were able to fetch more um, fishes on like they had even toiled the whole night and got nothing. So, um, one other similarity, let's move on to the next one that I want to talk about is that um, God told Moses to remove his sandals because the ground was what was holy. Now, John the Baptist said that he wasn't even worthy to, to lose in the sandals um, worn by Jesus because he is the holy one. Um, Next one, um, the fourth one, Moses brought what the Ten Commandments, and it's, it's, it's very interesting to know that he was the first to break it. He, he, he brought it and then he broke it. He was the first to break it. And so Jesus was also born under the law. It was for a reason. It was for a reason. Jesus was born under the law for a reason. Why? So that he could fulfill, so that he could live out all the Ten Commandments because no human being was able or is able or can ever be able, you know, to live all the Ten Commandments. And so Jesus, you know, live it out so that we can all what, be justified in him. Um, the next one, the face of Moses shone with glory on Mount Sinai. Um, when you read Exodus 34, verse 29, um, and then Second Corinthians 3, 7 to 9, the ministry of the Spirit against the ministry of death. And so his face shone with glory. And then when you read Matthew 17 as well, that was the Mount of Transfiguration. So Jesus, his face also was shown with the glory of God. Um, the last one that I'll probably talk about, I've already shared the link so you can look it up later on, is that Moses said that another prophet would come. He prophesied about Jesus, the coming of Jesus Christ. And Jesus too said that another would come, also referring to the Holy Spirit. My question to you is, do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Now, um, for someone, I don't know, but I just thought I should just chip this in. Uh, maybe you have followed this series and then you, you are kind of, you know, wondering that why are all these striking similarities between all these characters in the Bible, all these lead characters in the Bible? And I will attempt to answer you, and that is um, my viewpoint is in every generation, 
in every generation, God looks for true worshipers to, to serve that generation. And so as you begin to know God, he will begin to what, align your vision to his vision because it is his will against your will. And when that happens, there is only one message, and that is the message of the cross. Everything you, like you say or preach about, it should be about Jesus. If it is not about Jesus, trust me, it is so irrelevant in the kingdom. You know, as the Bible says that how can two work together unless what unless they agree? And so there, there, there needs to be that divine alignment. And so if you worship God and I worship God as in the true one God, then regardless, you might be in a different denomination. You might be um, charismatic, Pentecostal, Baptist, you know, um, Catholic, whatever it is. But the Bible says that what we are all one body. When you read Ephesians 4, 4 it says, for there is one body and there is one spirit just as we are all called in one hope or for our calling. And so, if only it's a Bible-believing church, I repeat, Bible-believing church, then the ultimate goal must be what must be one. And so that is how come you see all these you know, similarities between uh, Moses, Joseph, David, Daniel, Rahab, and all these you know, guys that we've already talked about. Um, on August 2nd, I shared something on, on my page, Rema City page, and I would like us to, you know, expound on that this morning. I would like us to expound on that this morning. The title of that message, it was a short uh, message that I shared. It was titled, Exposing Christ or Grace in the Old Testament. Um, and I will take the first reading. In Exodus 17, verse 11 to 12, the Bible says that as long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. As long as his hands were what lifted up, the, the, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. Verse 12. And when Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone. They took a stone. They took a stone. They took a stone. We will come to that stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and her, I don't know how to pronounce this word, so forgive me. It's H-U-R, whether it's who, whether it's her. Um, Aaron and her held his hands up one on one side. That means one on the left and then one on the other side, you know, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. Um, on July 29th, this is what the Lord remit me, and it was so, you know, clear to me that the hand of Moses, like Moses' hand was a projection of the cross and that represents what grace and so his hands were what divided was separated one on the left and one on the right signifying what um, the cross of jesus christ exactly you know same typo you know and so that was a foretaste of what was to what what was to come um let's even start from here you know as, as we begin to expound on that they both died on a hill so that's a common ground for us um how did moses win the battle by raising his hand, right? And he was in between two people, two people. Jesus was found all himself also in between two people. We will come to that um, very soon, you know, but there is actually one guy hidden in this, in this scene, and that is Joshua. The sword of Joshua was what was fighting. He was fighting with what, with the Amalekites in Exodus 17, and he what prevailed. But unbeknown to him, unbeknown to him, it wasn't because of his strength. It was because of the word, the intercessory prayer of Moses on that hill. And so you have Moses in between these two guys who are holding his hands high. And then Joshua is what is doing the fight. And so this morning as I pondered, you know, God just revealed to me that that actually, that battle was actually, you know, um, um, like a product of the law and grace. It was mixed um, like a mixture of what of the law and grace, and so they were able to what to 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 win that battle by what the law. I take it again, and then grace, the law and grace. But when it when you fast forward to Jesus, Jesus also was hanged, you know, on a hill on the cross, and he found himself in between two people, two sinners, two thieves. Um, one represents unbelief, because other guy did not believe. That Jesus could save him and anybody who does not believe like I just read in John 3 36 you will not make it one represents what unbelief and the other guy represents grace the grace generation and so Jesus ended it well 
he, he made it point blank that this is not something you work for. Salvation is a gift. I keep repeating um, this, 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 this line that salvation is what is a gift. It's not something you've worked for. It's not a reward for something you have what you have to work for. Your works are good. You'll be rewarded after you pass through that entry point to heaven. That entry point is your salvation. It is Christ what righteousness that he has imputed or imparted in you. That is your ticket or your passport to heaven. Now, after you have made it, your works will, will, will follow you. So I need us to take very, you know, good attention to that as well. Now, coming back to the stone, you know, Moses sat on the stone. It was just this morning as I pondered again and then God revealed it to me that the stone was actually a shadow of Peter, who is the rock upon which God will, will build his church. And so it turned out to be a big stone, which is the rock. You know, stone and rock, I mean, what is the difference? Stone is small and a big stone is what? It's a rock. And so that is your latest update from the throne room of grace, by the way. And this is what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration, you know. Um, the law came, was present, and then the prophets came. So Moses and then Elijah fulfilling the scriptures. He lived out. Remember, that is why I started by saying that Jesus lived out all the Ten Commandments. And then he said, you go, you go. Your time has what? Has expired. It's time for what? The grace generation to be birthed out. Now, grace is not a dispensation. It goes beyond that. It is the character of Jesus Christ. It is the character of God. That is who he is. But the Bible says that what? He's full of what? Grace and truth. He always had compassion on people. That is who he is. You know, so it, it, it kind of resonates with that song that says that you have done what no man can do and you will do what no man can also do. Without a doubt, you know, as, as we forge on, without a doubt, I can boldly say that our generation, this, this, this present generation, we are the most privileged, you know, like generation to ever exist. On planet earth because we have grace and it is mounted up 24 7 it's not just for a moment until sunset like Moses time like what happened no this time around grace is up and running it is active it is activated 24 7 and so you have no reason to fail in life you have no reason to live what a defeated life no the sons of God the Bible says that what we grow from what glory to glory from fit to fit them from what? From strength to strength. And so God has spent much from you. Why? Because now he lives in you. He lives in you. The deception comes when we begin to think that our own sweat, our own strength has produced this. No. People work more than you do, but God has blessed you more than they are. The Bible says that it is not he that wells, but it is God who shows what? Mercy. You know, there was a scripture that, like, very often we we tend to misconstrue that scripture. And I'll read it right ahead, which says that um, in Philippians 2, verse 12 to 13, the Bible says that, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, especially those who preach work. You know, the work folks, all they know is work, 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 which is good. I mean, we all work. Moses was working. I'll come to that. You know, we all need to work. Uh, Jesus said that my father is what is always working. You know, but as I said, I don't want to go back to it. Salvation is, is a gift, but your rewards shall be rewarded for what you've done in heaven. Your works will, what will follow you. Now, we say that verse all the time, but we never get to the next verse. So work out your salvation with what fear and trembling. I agree. But the next verse, Philippians 2, 12, the verse 13 says that, For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. So it was, it's, it's never your strength in the first place. For it is God who grants you what that enablement, who permits you the grace to be able to do whatever you are doing. If you are a big businessman, if you are a tycoon, whatever you are, remember one thing, it is never your strength. I know you work hard, but just bear in mind, I need you to rest, you know, in that assurance of the rest of God, of the grace of God, knowing that it is, it is what, it is God who is the chief driver. Although you are behind the wheels, God is, you know, the real chief driver behind you. You know, um, like I said, Moses was working, Mo Moses worked very hard. As, as a matter of fact, he worked tirelessly 
when you read Exodus 18 verse 13 to 17, you actually realize that this guy was working more than the normal ship, more than eight hours. Because the Bible says that he worked his fingers to the bone. He worked from morning to evening. There was no way to determine exactly the number of hours. But from morning to evening, that's like from dusk to dawn. You know, until his father-in-law came in and, and advised him that Moses, this thing you are doing is not wise, it's not good. You will wear yourself out. So appoint people. So that is how come he appointed 70 leaders, you know, to lead the nation, to help him out. And then only the crucial, the very, very critical ones will come up to him. In um, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 10, Paul, Apostle Paul also got it right. He said that, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain, but I labored. Listen, he said, I labored more abundantly than they all put all of the apostles combined together, all the disciples. He said, I labored. I like this guy, you know. I mean, what he was saying is, is, is the truth. He labored more than, what, than all of them. But he concludes with this, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 10, that yet not I, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me which was with me so never take the grace for granted i i need you to have that at the back of your mind you know that it has been christ through it all christ from your trajectory from birth to death everything i need you to lean you know your confidence should be what in that and not in your own strength um one thing that i would like us to take note also was that moses knew god the bible says that he, he talked with God face to face. And so for my iPhone users, I'm sorry, but it was Moses who was the first to, to use FaceTime with God. The Hebrew is, is actually that face to face. I did a, um, some research on it yesterday. And then I, I realized that it's a Hebrew idiom, um, which means mouth to mouth. Uh, it, it also means or could mean um, without a mediator. And then personally witnessing something divine. That's also another meaning. So the whole intent here is that there was no distance between God and Moses. You know, Bible says that he spoke to him like a friend who would speak to a friend. And when we read John 15, Bible, um, Jesus said that I now call you friends. I no longer call you servant. Moses was a servant. And now we are not even friends. We are more than friends because he has adopted us as, what, as sons. <clears throat> so what am, I, like, what am I saying? Where am I driving that? What I'm saying is simple. Today, we have a better covenant than the old, than the ministry of death, you know, because now Christ lives in us. And so we are supposed to achieve or accomplish more than all these folks were in the Bible. He knew God. <clears throat> in John 17, verse 3, the Bible says that I am come that you may know me, the true or the one true God. So do you know God? Ask yourself, do you know God? Is it in this is eternal life that you may know God? Do you know God? Moses knew God. If you seek him, you will find him. This morning, what I'm telling you, if you seek him, he will reveal himself to you or he will manifest himself to you. Um, this whole series is hung on the topic, I'm a type of Christ. And I don't want you, as I want to end this series, I don't want you to take it lightly. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.13 that till we all come to the unity of, of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of what? Of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Ephesians 4.13 actually means that we can grow or mature to a point where what, we match up with Jesus to the fullness of Christ. If I'm lying, then the Bible is lying and the scriptures cannot be broken, as we all know. And so it is possible, but it is a choice. We are all types of Christ. I, I don't want you to take this whole series lightly. We are all types of Christ. And I just read it out that you can grow in your faith. What? Actually, when you are born again, you have the full faith of God. But you are now a baby, as in the wisdom of Christ. First Corinthians 1.30 says that what? The wisdom of Christ is now our wisdom. And in other verses, it says that what? Let the mind of Jesus be in you. But, you know, you, you grow from, like, the way you go to class, from class 1 to class 2, um, your high school, you go to college, you grow. You know, as you learn the Bible, you discover new things, and God speaks to you, you know, and then you, you grow from there. But you, we, we all, whether you are an apostle or archbishop, it's a common ground for everybody. 
in Christ, there is equality between the sons of God. There is nothing like here or here. I understand all authority comes from God. But we can all, we all have the grace to achieve the full measure. And if I'm full and you are full, then what's the difference between you and me? There's no difference. You know, I, I just hope that you will get this. You know, I just pray that you will, you will get this. So, trying to wrap up this whole thing. Um, the Bible is a Christocentric book. And that means that Christ is at the center or the heart of it all. God told Abraham that your children, you know, shall take upon what? The gates of their descendants. And all through, you know, the bloodline of Abraham, you know, all throughout the seed of Abraham coming all the way to Jesus, they kept overcoming or conquering cities and winning battles and, you know, all throughout. He said that your, your descendants, your children would take what? The gates of their descendants. So it means that you today, you are in him, you are in Christ. When people reach a place and it becomes like a cul-de-sac, whatever it is, where like the road becomes impassable, you are supposed to go through it. When you are at work, something is very challenging, whatever you're going through, step out. Go out there and pray for 30 minutes, for one hour and come back. Trust me, the ideas will begin to, uh, to pop up. That is who we are. Where people get or rich and they get choked up, you are supposed to sail through it swimmingly, not just sail through it, you know, uh, go through it swimmingly. That is who we are, you know. And so you you get to the next point where something took what the gates are far off. And let me just end with Jesus. I, just, I can go through all of them. Jesus ripped it up. He just, you know, like ripped it apart when um, um, the veil of the Holy of Holies was what was torn into two. And then he said to Lemon, like, all of you, come on in, you know, like, come on in. And so now we all have the chance, the Gentiles and the Jews are like, to what, to, to witness this beautiful salvation that, that we have. Um, Rayan Bonke, he's an evangelist. Rayan Bonke said something that, you know, really caught my attention the other day. He said that the word of God, the God's word in his mouth is just as powerful in your mouth. And so the word the word of God, or what you say, what you decree, is just as powerful as the word in God's mouth. Why? Because he lives in you. The Holy Spirit lives in you. So I, I need you to live out this series. Live it out as a type of Christ. Watch the way you live your life. It matters a lot to God. You are now a type of Christ. This is, what, this is the finished work of what Jesus has done. Now he has made types of himself here. So we are repping him. He doesn't need to be here. We are here. We are taking charge here before he comes. And so the Bible says that now we are what? Epistles. Epistles. We are like a miniature of the Bible. We are, he has modeled each of you is like a, like a Bible on its own for others to, to read. If I'm lying, then the Bible is lying. So we are epistles. We are Bibles on our own you know, for others to, to read. You should leave a legacy before you go. That is what Jesus did. He changed the world. That is who we are. We are kings and priests. We are kings and priests. And so I've talked about Moses. We've learned about what? Grace. We've exposed grace in the Bible and we use Moses in this case, you know, as, as a case study. Um, this is a takeaway for us to go. I don't know who you are, but I'm prompted to say this. Moses, the first 40 years was in Egypt. He lived there as a prince and then he left away. He bolted away for um, another 40 years and at the last 40 years of his life he had to return i don't know who you are but god wants to tell somebody that it's time to go back to that which you fear the most you have to confront your fears your your problems it's time to leave your comfort zone and go back to that very thing that you fear this time leaning on the rest of god the rest is god's presence knowing that it is done it is done. It is a done deal. It is done, done, done. If I tell you it would be easy, I'll be, you know, I'll be, I'll be the greatest liar. It wouldn't be easy. But if you take that bold step, that leap of it, and go back and confront whatever it is you've been running from all your years, it is well with you all. This is all I can tell you. Moses had to go back. A lot of the characters in the Bible, they had to go back to that very thing they had been running from all their lives. Maybe God has placed an idea on your heart and you've been doing your own stuff. I don't know. It could be even a business idea. It could be something. 
but it's time for you to confront that very thing. That's it. Your assignment for today is to read Psalm 40, verse 1 to 3. I like the three. The three says that many will hear my testimony. Many will hear my testimony and they will fear the Lord. They will put their trust in the Lord. So I need you to read that verse, um, um, Psalm 40, verse 1 to 3, and make it yours. Decree it into being. Personalize it. You know, I, I from this time, if there is any prayer request, I need you to probably end with this, that whatever you do for me, God, I, 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 I want it to be like, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve this job. I don't deserve this house. I don't deserve this wife. I don't deserve this ministry. You know, everybody will see and attest to the fact that only God can do this. That is what that scripture says. That what people will hear my new testimony, my new song of praise, and they'll be like, wow. And they like it will it will it will even you know make them draw nigh to Christ. Like because of this, wow, can God do this? Yes, He can. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So that is your assignment. Psalm 40, verse 1 to 3. And I believe it will be such a great blessing uh for 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 you. Um Moses himself, it's 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 very funny. Moses himself lived a life full of grace, right from his birth. Even to his barrier, because it was angels who buried him. You know, he lived in the palace. This guy enjoyed grace all his life. But these people, the people of Israel, he called them the faithless generation, like children without faith. And so he was actually enjoying grace. And then he gave the law to them. If you don't believe this, and, and, and you dare not touch him. If you want to try, just ask his own sister. Ask his sister what happened to her, you know, her when she attempted. I know you know the story. You know, to insult, to kind of have that little traction with Moses. What happened? This guy was full of grace. And so you are untouchable. Keep that also in mind that you are what? You are you are untouchable. And so I, I, I need you to go through life today, you know, having that lens, that that lens of Jesus Christ, that in him there is no sin. And so you are justified. A lot of people are not able to do great things for God because they live with guilty conscience. They have all this, you know, because people are preaching words, 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 and they're not preaching grace. If I take my own life, for instance, trust me, I've done things that I'm not so proud of. But Christ looks at me as if I've never seen before. And that's the reality. And that is who we are. Why? Because I am in him. We say this all the time. Christ in you, what the hope of what? Of glory. When you read Jude 24, Jude is just one chapter, Jude um, verse 24, or Jude 24, it says that what unto him who is able to present us faultless, without what a single fault, clean sheet, no blemish. A friend of mine will say, clean sheet, no blemish. And so we are what we are in him. When God sees me, he sees me as Jesus. He sees me through the lens of Jesus. And so I'm going to make a bold um, statement and I won't take it back. If you are a Christian, in the end, in the end, is a means to an end. In the end, you've never seen before and you will never let a sin like, like a sinful life. Why? Because you are in him. Is there any sin in Jesus Christ? Can there be any sin in him? It's not possible. And so if you are in him and he is in you, then what does it mean? You know, when you have this consciousness, now you begin to act freely, knowing when even you fault or go wrong, Grace is there. Grace is not for us to sin, but it's for us to know that, oh, I am justified. And so Satan, you can't hold me back because of this, what I've done in the past or now. No, 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 we have that assurance, you know. You see, I was kind of having a little debate with a friend, and then I said, no, sin has no dominion in our time. And that's also a strong statement, and I will not take it back as well because it is the truth. All these folks, unless you don't know the Bible, all these folks in the Bible, they, they kept looking towards our day, looking for a day where sin will no longer have dominion. The Bible says what? He will save his people from their sins. Us. The Bible says that what? Here comes what? The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of what? The world. He's already taking it. And so what the Bible says that what? Seek him whilst he may be found. This is your time. When you hear the word of God, don't harden your heart. Allow him to come into your life. His dreams, like I always say, is better than yours. Would you allow him in your life today? 
So long as he hasn't come, the grace is provided. No sin, whether it's murder, whether it's whatever, is greater than the blood. The problem is, you see, sin itself is like it's not really the border to Christ, but it's an unrepentant sin, habitual sin. You keep doing it. You know this is wrong and you keep doing it. And that's a border to, Christ, to our Father in heaven because it doesn't reflect our true nature. Because if you sin, then it means you don't know the Father. That means you don't know Christ. Because if you know him, you will not sin. And so Paul says that what awake and do not sin. Awake unto righteousness and do not sin. We've all fallen. You will fall, you will rise, you will fall, you will rise. As a matter of fact, if you're a true Christian, you fall. There is this great pain like, why did I do this? It shouldn't even take you more than 24 hours to get back to your first love. That is who we are. It is our nature. We are like resistant to sin. Sin touches like, how, how did this happen? You know, and so it's, it's rather a habitual sin. It means now you know what you're doing, but you don't want to repent because he's always faithful and just. He's, he's what? He's always faithful. Sorry about this call. Faithful and just to, to forgive us. So this is the word for you. Ask yourself. I didn't really say any Raymond word today because I need you to pick something, you know, some footprints from this message. So ask yourself as I end this message that, um, Holy Spirit, what are you telling me? What are you telling me? Not just for everybody, but just for me. And if you have learned something, I'll be glad if you can share it on my space. I learned this in the course of the series. I'll be very glad. So once again, um, thank you very much for spending, you know, your quality time with me. I cherish it. And I say God bless you and be with you. I pray that the grace of God will team in your life like never before. May your day be blessed. Amen. And I'll see you soon. Um, next week, um, as I'm led, I'll probably go into some other areas. All right. Thank you. And bye for now.